All right, everybody who is here, welcome to yet another episode of free Zoom cooking class with Jenny Wheeler of the Family Table Collaborative, where she creates delicious and healthy versions of a lot of comfort foods and provides us all sorts of um, alternatives and additions to these great recipes. And remember, the first ingredient is love, right? <laughs> so take it away, Jenny. Thanks, Tony. I am super excited to be back, partnered with the Hyannis Public Library. We are coming to you from my really good friend, Pam Hoffman's Kitchen, who does these most amazing Cajun cooking classes that benefit the Family Table Collaborative. I feel so lucky. And we wanted to make sure we had good Wi-Fi, a beautiful kitchen, and some really fun stuff for you. So here we are, back at it. September, can you believe it's September? I just wanna take a second. This is my favorite month on Cape Cod. October is probably my second favorite month. So we're edging towards that. But Cape Cod is gorgeous in the fall, absolutely beautiful. I feel like a lot of people go away and we get our little peninsula back and it's so nice because the weather is Perfect. It's so nice. So welcome today to Cooking Live Time with me, Jenny Wheeler. I am the co-founder and director of the Family Table Collaborative, and I am so excited about tonight. I'm not going to lie. Tony had been all over me about giving her a recipe, and I have been moving, writing grants, doing all the things. So I was just exhausted. <laughs> and feeling completely uninspired. In the other morning, I woke up and the fresh air coming in my window was spectacular. It was like that crisp fall air. And I texted Tony and I said, I know what I wanna do. That's it, I know what I wanna do. So today we are going to make a healthier version of one of my favorites, tomato soup and grilled cheese. So instead of traditional tomato soup, we're gonna add a ton of different vegetables. We're going to really add a lot of nutritional like value to a dish that could be high in salt and not necessarily high in nutrition. I mean, tomatoes are awesome, but here on Cape Cod, they're even more awesome because they grow here and we can get them from local farms all over Cape Cod. Capabilities is one of the farms that partners with the collaborative and their tomatoes are amazing. So as I mentioned in the ingredient list, heirloom tomatoes are absolutely my favorite. They often don't look perfect. And that's something we talk about a lot is food in its natural state. Natural vegetables don't always look perfect. They're not grown to look perfect. However, we're kind of trained to expect them to look perfect. And if they don't, we kind of think something's wrong with them. So I'm not gonna lie, I went to the store today to get tomatoes and I couldn't get heirloom tomatoes, they didn't even have any. So I have on the vine tomatoes, which I love, but make sure you realize when food looks extra perfect, uh, you might wonder what they did to it to make it look that way. So from that health perspective, you're gonna see us not only use tomatoes, I suggested at least four tomatoes, and I have four here. I actually have five, just in case. And then a crushed tomato. I didn't list that, but if you want it to be a little bit thicker, that's one way. I did list diced tomatoes because, again, not everything has to be completely like from scratch. It, you can get really healthy ingredients right out of your pantry, which makes life a lot easier, right? Saves us some time. I suggested that you have either a blender or an immersion blender. And the reason is a lot of people, when they talk about tomato soup, they, like, they actually cook the tomatoes, peel them. I don't do that you actually get a lot of nutrients right in the skin. And so, but you don't want it to be stringy. So what I do is I actually use an immersion blender or my Vitamix or a blender or whatever you have available to you to puree it because it can give you a really nice texture and a lot of really good nutrition kept in there instead of taking the skin off. So we're gonna do tomato soup. 
with lots of additional vegetables, which like I said, ramps up that nutritional content. And we're gonna use a lot of fresh herbs. So we have fresh basil right out of Pam's garden, which is super exciting. Um, I brought some scallions. I like to use fresh scallions kind of on top. They're not necessary, but they're fun. I have parsley over here. And then I also picked up, I didn't list it, Cilantro is one of those things that half the population likes it and half the population thinks it tastes like soap. And that actually is based on something in your genetic code. So I love cilantro. I use it on a ton of things, including my eggs in the morning, but some people don't. So I, I brought it. But part of what you'll notice when I do recipes with you guys is I always like to give you options. I like to make sure you realize following directions is fine. And if it gives you comfort to do so, have at it. We are gonna get the recipe after the class that I use. However, you also, there's all sorts of alternatives and it's not based on a right or a wrong. It's based on your palate how you taste things, what tastes good to you. So for the soup, we're gonna do it that way. Something else you might see here is I have actually cabbage. I have um, a, a Chinese cabbage here, which I use in a lot of my soups. I boil it down. I feel like it adds a good base. And again, if you're doing things like Weight Watchers, there's no points with cabbage. You can have cabbage in anything. It's really good roughage. It's really good fiber. So, you know, me, I add it to a lot of things, but no one even knows because they never see it or taste it. They just are like, oh my goodness, it tastes so good. Well, because I add a lot of flavor with additional vegetables, okay? Vegetables and herbs. So then the second part of this, and of course, it's kind of my favorite. I'm not going to lie. I love cheese. So, you know, not super healthy necessarily all the time, but love it nonetheless. So I love cheese. So what I mentioned is an alternative to grilled cheese, which not, let's face it, is so good when we fry it in butter on both sides and then it has that delicious butter taste. But the reality is, maybe not super healthy for you. So how can you keep all that indulgence, that feel of indulgence, while maybe giving up something that, you know, you're not even really gonna notice. If you bake the toast and add the cheese, you don't realize the butter is gone. Like you don't miss it because it's crunchy, it's delicious. The other thing is if you use cheeses with a lot of flavor, that adds that and you never miss the butter. So let's get started you're welcome at any point in time to ask questions in the chat i will try and give you options kind of all the way through you can also submit questions after the fact i'm happy to answer anything you might have but what's going to happen is we're going to go through it i'm going to give you some alternatives some suggestions and the other thing we talk about sometimes is what else can you do with the ingredients because sometimes we all know we buy ingredients for a dish and then we have all of this extra stuff left over and it's like, okay, great. What do I do with that? So we try and talk through some of those things as well. So with that being said, welcome to Cooking Live Time with me, Jenny Wheeler. I'm super excited to have all of you and let's get started because really the most amount of time is actually once we get all of this chopped up, we're going to boil it off for like 20 minutes before we blend it. That's the hardest part about this. Like it's pretty good. And by the way, it freezes beautifully. So if you have extra, if you're one person or two people and you have extra, you always can freeze it off, save it for another time. Nothing tastes as hometown, like tasty comfort food for me as tomato soup and my healthier take on grilled cheese. All right, so let's get started. Um, I also brought celery. And the reason I brought celery is there's a lot of people that deal with salt as an issue. Celery has natural salt um, and it avo helps avoid using additional salt. So sometimes, particularly because we're, we're pureeing it, if you have a salt issue or an issue with salt in your food, use a little bit of celery, saute it with the onions. So we're gonna start with an onion. So we're gonna cut up an onion. 
I cut the ends off. Everybody does this differently. I'm not going to tell you there's a right or a wrong way. Most of you who have watched me know I have a nerve injury in my right elbow. So cutting for me is much harder than it used to be. But we all do the best we can. So what I'm going to do is I have a very large onion here. So I'm going to take half of it. I'm going to set the rest aside. And literally, you're going to puree it so it doesn't have to be exact. And I'm a big fan of not having to be super exact because that scares people when you're cooking. So the one thing is you never want your fingers between you and the knife. So I'm literally just kind of rough dicing, rough dicing the onion. I'm going to, I'm not even going to start cooking quite yet. I'm going to get a couple of things in. Pam has a super cute tomato pot. Who has a tomato pot? You guys have to actually see the cover. Let's be clear. Who has a tomato pot? Pam, Pam has a tomato pot. She's never used it. She's letting us use it for the first time tonight. We are so special. So anyway, we're using our tomato pot for our tomato soup. Isn't that fun? So we are going to get that ready. I am gonna put the onions in. And then we're gonna cut up the tomatoes. Now I mentioned around four tomatoes. The only part that I don't want you to cut up is right here. Everything else, the seeds, the skin, everything. I'm just gonna literally cut out the top and take it out. That's it, that's all I'm doing. And what I'm doing is I'm gonna basically cut it in kind of eights. I'm cutting it in half and then in half the other way. So you can see they're big chunks, they're not tiny. I'm putting them in. I'm using four tomatoes, four decent sized tomatoes. And if you, at any point in time, you feel like I'm going too fast or you're lost at all, again, don't hesitate to write something in the chat. My friend Tony will make sure I know if you have a question or if you're confused at all. So we're just cutting up those four tomatoes. We're adding them to our, we're adding them to our onions that are already in the pot. And you'll note, I did not put anything in the pan. So, there is no oil, there's no butter, no nothing. I'm doing that on purpose. It's a non-stick pan. And in fairness, it keeps it that little bit healthier because none of us needs more oil and fat. Um, and some oil and fat is good, so don't get me wrong. I'm not trying to say don't have any, but processed oil and fat is rarely necessary with what we take in normally. So, all right, tomatoes in the pan with the onions. I am going to add a little bit of cabbage, even though I didn't tell you guys to get it. I'm gonna add a little bit. And to be honest, the inside of this cabbage does not look awesome. I'm gonna take out a little bit of it. And again, this is where I was saying, food isn't always, food isn't designed to look perfect. So, I'm gonna add a touch of it because cabbage to me adds a really nice flavor. Um, I'm gonna use the bottom of it just because the top doesn't look as good to me. And I'm doing just kind of a rough cut. Now, if salt is an issue and you happen to have celery around, you can cut up a little bit of your celery. I brought some, I'm not gonna use it because I am actually going to use some of the adobo. However, again, if salt is an issue, what we want to focus on is fresh herbs, fresh spices, not anything that has salt in it. Because we can add a lot of flavor through other things. But most people in the United States aren't used to that. So salt is the default. But we really want to work to get away from that. Hey, so, Jenny. Yes. Jenny, we have a question. Yes, ma'am. Um, uh, would you use the cabbage as well as the baby spinach? Yes. So both of them would be in there. 100%. And as a matter of fact, something else you could add. So I will tell you this now, it's jumping ahead a little bit. 
I never add my greens under significant heat. So if it's baby kale, if it's baby spinach, I actually wait until I turn it off. Then I add it so it wilts it. And this is whether I'm pureeing it or not. So I allow it to wilt it, but I don't actually put it under heat because it breaks it down in a, I don't put it under high heat because it breaks it down in a different way and it actually loses some of its nutritional value. So I turn everything off before I put my greens in. So I have my baby spinach, triple washed, so I don't have to wash it, just saves one step, um, all ready to go and I will dice it and put it in at the very end before we puree it. Because again, I am gonna puree this soup. So in addition to the tomatoes, I ask you to get a can of diced tomatoes. I'm going to hold those off. And this is a choice for you. I like my tomato soup to have some chunks. A lot of people do not. So the diced tomatoes are to help save time and save some money with more fresh tomatoes, but it's also a question of whether or not you like your soup a little bit chunky. So this gives you the option to add chunks after you puree it. If you are somebody who likes a smooth soup, go ahead and add them now. I'm gonna hold off on mine, okay? So this is another thing. I suggested a can of chickpeas and just as an alternative, I also brought a, a potato. People have preferences on how thick their soups are. Some people like their soups very thin. For example, clam chowder. There is an age old debate. Do you like a clam chowder? And for those of us that are vegan or vegetarian, I recognize I'm not talking to you <laughs> because that's harder to do with clam chowder. However, if you like a super thick, your spoon stands up in your chowder, I don't understand you. <laughs> <laughs> because I do not like that. Um, a lot of times what creates that is a super thick roux designed with flour and it just gets, ah, it's not my thing. It's not my thing, but I'm not judging you. If you like it, I totally understand, but kind of not <laughs> because I like thinner. <laughs> I like thin, thin, thin. However, potatoes, I also use yucca as a thickener a lot in some of my soups. Potatoes, chickpeas or uh, beans in general. I brought a great Northern white bean um, just as another example. All of those are ways that you, things you can add that when you puree it, it will add a thickener to it. So it helps you thicken it without adding a ton of extra calories and actually adding nutrition. So there you go, whatever you want. I'm not gonna add the potato. I don't think I need it, but I wanted to make sure you knew. So we talked about a zucchini. We're gonna add the zucchini. And again, considering we're pureeing everything, you don't have to be super specific. I just cut it in quarters. I'm gonna large chunk it. Zucchini will cook a lot faster than a lot of things. So it's gonna cook down faster. And here's another preference point. So I mentioned butternut squash. I said peeled fresh butternut squash. The grocery store had none no butternut squash, peeled or not peeled when I went. So I went with frozen. And this is one of the benefits. A lot of our frozen vegetables actually are higher in nutrition than some of our fresh because the frozen often gets dealt with immediately and some of the fresh sits on trucks for quite a while. So if you're ever feeling like, oh wow, like I feel light on vegetables or I'm not sure, if you have a frozen option, it's not a bad option. So for me today, I listed it as an ingredient. I didn't wanna not have it. However, it's gonna make your tomato soup a little bit sweeter. So the, not too sweet, the butternut squash won't go too sweet. So I'm gonna add in about a, maybe a third of the bag. We'll call it half a cup, maybe two thirds of a cup. 
So I'm not going to add too much because I don't like a super sweet tomato soup. Then we have our fresh basil. I love when we're cooking at someone's house and they have fresh stuff out back. That's so fun. So this is fresh basil. For basil, particularly for this type of thing, you don't want the stems. Sometimes I'm actually not opposed to taking some of the stem, but for this, we're gonna pick it right at the base of the leaf. And I'm using, I like basil in my tomato soup. So I probably have, I don't know, five or six good sized leaves here. Again, this is a preference. You can determine kind of exactly how much. And one thing with herbs, you can always start light and add more, right? It doesn't go the other way. You can't get it back. So if you're not sure, go light. I'm just doing a little bit of a dice. A little bit of a dice. All right, put that in there. All right, so the one other thing I mentioned, I brought a leek because I had not listed that, but just like onion, leeks are beautiful flavor. I brought some carrots and carrots are an awesome alternative to butternut squash. They will also add that same type of sweetness, but again, you can chunk it. It's gonna add that little bit of sweetness. Do you like sweet? Yes. We have another question. Okay. The question is, can you substitute fresh pesto for fresh basil? So some, depending on what the pesto is made out of, first, the answer is yes, you can, you can substitute, substitute pesto. Um, some pestos have cheese. So if you're vegan, you need to like pay attention to whether or not it has cheese in it, but you're always welcome to substitute pesto. And I love that question because to me, it means you're kind of thinking of additional things you can do with it. And I'm all about that. So yes. Because actually that's a great point because most pesto is heavy in garlic. So you can use fresh garlic. You also can use granulated garlic, whatever makes sense to you guys as far as what your comfort zone is. If you're you know, trying to limit how much you're spending at the store and you already have granulated garlic, you certainly can use that. I decided to bring a little bit of fresh because if I have the option, I pretty much always choose to go fresh. But again, acknowledging that it's not always an option, hence my butternut squash. So I cut the top, cut the bottom, peel it off. Um, a great little tool, your hands are gonna smell like garlic. Um, I always use a little bit of lemon water when I'm done to help take away the garlic. If you don't love garlic, then I would actually put gloves on when you're peeling it because there's no way to get rid of it totally. <laughs> I happen to love the smell of garlic, so it doesn't bother me. But again, just something to be aware of if you're dealing with fresh garlic, the scent is very strong. So here we go. I just used two pretty good size um, cloves. I'm just cutting it up a little bit. Again, this whole thing's gonna be pureed. So just diced it up a little bit. All right, we got that in. So the only thing left that I had put on the original list is peppers. So pepper, again, pepper can add a little bit of sweetness. I brought a yellow and a red. So you can use whatever color you want. If you, if you don't like peppers, you don't have to add them. Again, this is, the, this is the fun and flexibility around cooking with fresh food. You can use your palette, but I'm gonna actually add a little bit of yellow. Not gonna lie, my favorite color pepper is orange. Although roasted red peppers probably forever will be one of my favorite things. So the only thing that, um, I'm taking out is the little bit of skin right there. The seeds, you don't necessarily need the seeds. If a couple get in, it's not a big deal. Um, again, I'm gonna fairly rough cut these, not too big, but we're gonna puree it. So I'm not totally worried about the size. And again, this is the benefit of pureeing things. It's very forgiving. <laughs> it's very forgiving. So 
And of course, soup, hence one of the reasons fall is one of my favorite seasons. Soup is what my brand was based on. Soup for me is comfort. Soup for me is family, it's community. It's, it's a way to feed a lot of people with a really healthy meal. There's just something very comforting about soup. And the fact that you can make it and then freeze most of them is also really beneficial because we all know groceries are super expensive these days. So here we go. You should have most of your ingredients, don't feel rushed, most of your ingredients in a pan. I'm gonna throw out a couple other things that I brought that I didn't say you needed and you do, definitely don't. I brought organic rice cauliflower. You can add that in. I also brought green chilies. If you like a little bit of heat or a lot of heat, you always can add a little bit extra. You can add some jalapenos. Working with jalapenos, if you take out the seeds, if you roast them off or if you saute them off, it actually mellows the flavor significantly. So people think, oh my God, they're hot, but they don't have to be. So a lot of different peppers, you just kind of have to ask what's the heat grade on it, but it's kind of nice, it, particularly on those really cold nights to add a little bit of heat, particularly if it's back heat, right? You don't feel like, oh my goodness, it's so spicy, but you do have that little bit of back heat. So what, what we're gonna do with this is I am going to, well, no, I'm gonna hold off on my tomatoes. I'm gonna add about two cups of water, okay? So we're gonna add about two cups of water. All right, so I've added two cups of water and now what we're gonna do is we're gonna put this on boil. We're going to get it to kind of a low simmer and, but we definitely want it boiling because we need it to cook through. And what we're gonna do is we're going to, so I'm starting it on high, I'm gonna watch for it to boil, and then we're gonna simmer it for about 20 minutes. And at that point in time, dinner is pretty much gonna be ready other than pureeing it. And then obviously tasting it, right? We need to make sure we're tasting it, spicing it to taste. So. As I mentioned, anyone who's cooked with me before, I love adobo. Adobo is kind of an everything spice. It's very inexpensive, but it does have salt in it. So I like it because it has a lot of other things in addition to salt, but if you're salt sensitive, that's not something you're gonna to wanna to use. I also mentioned in the ingredient list that you had the option of using sour cream. I also could have said cream cheese, creme fraiche, or heavy cream. I love a creamy tomato soup. If you're lactose intolerant, if you are vegan, that's obviously not something you wanna do. However, there are some vegan cheeses or vegan, there's a Mykonos sour cream that's very, very good. So it really, when you're talking about vegan alternatives, it's very much to your palate preference. So it's kind of tough. Daya is one of the kind of oldest versions of vegan cheese. I didn't love it when it first came out. I think they've done a much better job with it, but something you should watch with any type of alternative processed food, and this applies whether it's vegetarian, vegan or not, is the more high level of processing, often the less healthy it is for you. So first you need to figure out what is good for flavor preference. Um, and some of them are great if you don't try and melt them and are terrible if you try and melt them. Um, like I said, the, there's also Kite Hill for a sour cream. I think it's a little tangier than traditional sour cream, but for people who are vegan, I've had people tell me they absolutely love it. So it really, again, it's up to your preference, but there's always an option to keep something vegan or vegetarian if you want to. So one of the things, the only thing I think we actually didn't add is the better than bouillon. This is my favorite type of bouillon. It's a paste. Um, it's a low sodium and to me, it has the best flavor. It's organic. Um, I buy mine, the reason you see this type of jar is I buy mine at Costco. There is no Costco around here. Um, and I do that really from a price standpoint 
this jar at Costco is I think $6.29. A jar this big at most of the stores is like $5.99. So for me, I could never afford to use it if I was buying it at regular stores, which is why I buy it at Costco. Um, so for the quantities I cook for the collaborative would not be an option. So that's that. All right, let's talk cheesy toast. Okay, again, back to, I love cheese. <laughs> it is, I have no sweet tooth. However, I love savory and my favorite savory is cheese. It's comfort food. So I mentioned in the ingredient list that again, there's no right or wrong. It's whatever, you can make really good cheesy toast out of a lot of different things. You can, I brought, I think I said my favorite, like one of my favorite toasts was like a really good, like hearty grain. So I brought an ancient grain sandwich bread. And then as an alternative, I bought back, I brought baguettes that you can bake off. And so you would toast them a little bit before you added the cheese. So for me, crusty bread is one of my favorite things. Drop me anywhere in Europe and give me crusty bread and some marinated like olives and maybe a little bit of dried meat and of course some dry red wine. And I'm a happy camper. So for me, crusty bread's always good, but again, it doesn't matter. The benefit of cheesy toast is you can have like bread that's actually going a little bit stale. And this is a great way to use it. You put a little cheese on it, you toast it and or effectively, if you put a little cheese on it and toast it, or even if you put a little bit of spices on it, you toast it, guess what it becomes? Croutons. Or if it doesn't become croutons, guess what else gets become? Breadcrumbs. So again, you are reducing waste using the really good food you have already. We don't have to necessarily go out and buy something else, but crispy toast is crispy toast. So if you take any of your breads that you have, again, I mentioned you can use whatever cheeses you want. To be honest, you can sprinkle Parmesan, throw a little bit of pepper, a little bit of garlic, and it is going to be darn tasty. However, if you want to get a little bit more indulgent, a little bit fancier, we can bring in our cheeses. I mentioned that there are a million and one. There's no, there's no shortage of great cheese if you like cheese. Again, if you're a vegan, there are a lot of shredded cheeses that are out on the market now that didn't exist even a couple of years ago. So if you like the flavor of cheese and are vegan, there are alternatives you can use. I what did I get? I got a Gouda. This one's from Holland. I got a Fontina because I love Fontina on cheesy toast. And then I got a nice soft cheese because I'm a little bit obsessed with soft cheese. <laughs> so what we're going to do is we're just going to open these up. We're going to use a little bit, whatever cheeses you have. If you have shredded, use shredded. If you need to shred it, go ahead and do it. If you want to use thin slices, that's good too. If you want to do a little tasting, that's always the best part of cooking is tasting. So I'm just using a little bit of kind of all of them. I'm going to mix it up. Sure. Yep. Um, and again, it's to your preference, how much, what type. There is no right or wrong answer. That's the benefit of cooking not necessarily a right or wrong. I can make suggestions. I can tell you what my favorite are, but some cheeses are also extremely expensive. So whatever works for you. This one has a nice rind on it. So I'm gonna cut a little bit back on the Fontina. Now I've gone with cheeses here that have a little bit of I'm gonna say bite, but I don't mean that in a bad way. They have a strong flavor because I really like strong flavored cheese. I feel like it adds a beautiful complement to bread. So I'm cutting up a little bit of all of them. 
pumpkin. Would you like a piece of one? Oh God, yes. <laughs> Which would you like? Cool. Pam is running my camera off screen. So she gets the benefit of tasting right here. And of course she's letting us use her kitchen. So and you're not even supposed to be eating cheese, are you? I just thought I'm contributing to the delinquency of your current condition. Crap. <laughs> Way to think about that after the fact, Jenny. Here, have cheese, something you're not supposed to be eating right now because you're not feeling good. <laughs> okay, so we have some really nice cheeses. I'm gonna raise my hands. I'm not gonna lie, if I was in my own kitchen right this second and I wasn't on camera, I would be super tempted to eat that cheese off my fingers. But here we are. <laughs> We're gonna do it right. So I'm gonna open one of these baguettes. These are kind of like that half bake at home. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna stick this in the oven. I have the oven on at 450 degrees. Um, now, here's the benefit. You don't have to fire up your oven. You can use a toaster oven if you have one. So if you have a toaster oven, I always suggest that you preheat. Oh, I just lost the baguette. Underneath the handle, there we go. I always suggest you preheat your oven, whether it's a toaster oven or whether it's a regular oven. My oven happens to be underneath me, which is why you're seeing me bend over. Um, and that gets your toast a little bit crispy before you add the cheese. Now here's the benefit. If we were making grilled cheese, we'd throw it in a fry pan. What would we put in the fry pan? We would put butter normally. And who doesn't want butter? I love butter. All right, I've got a nice boil going on. I'm going to add a teaspoon. I'm gonna turn this down so it's less. I still want it. I still want it boiling. I just don't want it overflowing. And I'm going to right behind you. Right behind. Oh, thanks. Well, this is a tablespoon, but I'm gonna use a teaspoon. So a tablespoon is three teaspoons for any of you that don't know I'm using. Oh, I'm just throwing it out of Pam's cabinets. All right, so I'm using a teaspoon of the bouillon. I'm mixing it in. I'm gonna wipe off the one I just dropped on Pam's cabinet. And then we're going to cover it and we're going to cook it off for about 10 to 15 more minutes because we want to make sure all of the vegetables are kind of cooked down a little bit. Okay, lower the boil. Okay, I've got my toast in the oven. I have the bouillon now in with all the vegetables and we have our cheese cut. I think it's a perfect time. A, does anyone have any questions? B, it's a good time to taste whatever cheese you have. And C, it's a really good time to mention, I love to talk about other things that can be made with the ingredients. And an awful lot of these ingredients can be used to make a killer Bloody Mary. So Pam was nice enough to whip up that for me with a lot of these ingredients. And here's something super fun. If you use all the ingredients, boil a lot of this down, puree it, right? You can freeze it. So this, what you're seeing is frost. This is a pre-made Bloody Mary mix. It doesn't have any liquor in it. It just is the Bloody Mary mix. So what happens is you can take it out as you want it using all of the freshest ingredients, everything that you see here, you can use anything you want, right? It's like the healthiest version of V8 you're ever going to have. So good for you. And then if you're so inclined, and yes, liquor is not good for you, but in moderation, it's okay. So if you're somebody who once in a while likes a cocktail, I'm okay with that. I hope you're okay with that. Here we go. We have homemade Bloody Marys 
that literally you cannot beat this. It's amazing. Mm. And all of those nutritious ingredients in it, like so much flavor. This is the cool thing about cooking. You can get so much flavor from all of these vegetables. So much fun. All right. So are there any questions with everything we've done? I want to make sure people are comfortable that you've kind of gotten an idea of how you can use some of these ingredients. You don't have to use all of them. There's a whole mix of ways you can make this. But to me, I'm usually like the more vegetables, the better. So tasty. And it's also important to me to expose you to a really wide berth of vegetables because unfortunately it's just so common we get stuck in a rut right we all eat like we tend to eat the same things all the time by the way before there's any questions the other thing that's super cool about this is if you make this tomato soup and then you chill it and then you dice up a little bit you add a little bit of scallion i've got some fresh scallions cut up right here you can chop up some fresh cilantro you can chop up some fresh cucumbers. Pam has some right out of her garden. All of a sudden, your amazing, delicious, nutritious tomato soup became gazpacho. It's just hey, a Jenny, soup. Yes. We've got another question. All right. That was, was the Bloody Mary just the tomato soup strained? I think I missed something. Sorry. <laughs> No, so it was, it actually is pureed. It's a ton of the ingredients pureed. It is not strained. Um, so it's just the ingredients pureed. Um, I have a Vitamix. I can pulverize anything in it, um, but this is just the ingredients pureed. That's okay, it. So it basically is the, the soup, but chilled. Yep, not cooked frozen. Or cooked. Yep, kind of made into a frosty. But is it cooked first? Yes. Okay, so it's this, the finished soup, basically. Correct. All right, here we go. Just giving you kind of that alternative on uses. Not to be confused with trying to make you drink. <laughs> so I'm pulling out my par-cooked baguettes. They're now nice and toasty. And so what we're gonna do instead of using that butter is we're going to add some nice cheese. And I may actually need to cut a little more because I forgot I was using the baguettes. Now, again, moderation, you can do less, you can do more, whatever you're comfortable with. This soft cheese is one of my favorites. Thank you. So I'm scattering some of these cheese bits across the top. Now I'm going, actually, I'm not gonna add adobo. So if I was using just garlic toast, I would probably do a little bit of adobo. But cheese has a natural level of salt in it. So you don't necessarily, um, do you have a granulated garlic? Um, so you can use a, gra I'm gonna use a granulated garlic because the cheeses I chose are pretty um, sharp. You also, like I said, you can use a parm or something like that, fantastic. Um, you can use a parm. To me, like the sharper the cheese is, a little, it's a little bit nicer. But for somebody else, they might say, no, I know a lot of people who call a lot of cheeses stinky cheese because they just don't like anything that has a little bit of bite to it. I tend to like that. So it's not a, it really is just a preference. So garlic back into the oven, our cheesy toast goes. Now, it's not gonna take that long. Once you get it kind of toasted, it's not gonna take that long. So normally I would actually probably stop my soup, get it ready to puree before I start the toast because the timing will probably be about right. 
but I wanted to make sure you kind of saw me make it and kind of all the alternatives and have the option of what to do. Again, it cuts out the butter. It cuts out a lot of that fat that you would usually use. And if you don't use this, it can become croutons or, you know, it can kind of become cheesy breadcrumbs. But if you have cheese on it and you make it into croutons or into um, breadcrumbs, you need to refrigerate it. Just keep that in mind. So let's check our soup. We can see our fun tomato pot. I think we're just about ready to get it pureed down. So what I suggested is either if you have a blender or an immersion blender. If you don't know what an immersion blender is, this is one. You literally, it's like a blender blade that you immerse into a liquid and it blends it kind of from underneath. I smell our cheesy toast already. <laughs> All right, I'm gonna kill the, cancel off. All right, we're gonna kill our cheesy toast down there so it doesn't overcook too much. This is, like I said, the immersion blender. This is one of my favorite tools. I use it constantly. This is Pam's. It's really, really nice. The one I have in my commercial kitchen is like this big. <laughs> it looks a little bit like a really big drill. Um, and it's somewhat scary to people who have never seen one before, but this is a really nice home immersion blender. So what we're gonna do is we cannot, I'm not gonna immersion blend in this beautiful pan. So once you get it to a point that you feel like we can test it, um, to make sure everything is done. So what you're looking for is that your fork can easily go through anything in it. As long as your fork can easily go through anything in your pan, it's ready to be blended. And mine, 10. So it can. Yes, ma'am, you want a bowl? Question from within. Yes, I would like a bowl. I'm adding what's about a half a teaspoon of adobo. And I'm also adding a little bit of white pepper. Now, this is one of those things that is a personal preference. I love white pepper. I love white pepper. To me, it is a more subtle flavor than the coarse black pepper my baker to test white pepper <laughs> and can taste it if I put it in anything. She prefers black pepper. So that's a total personal preference. I just really like it. I'm also now going to add our can of chickpeas before I puree it. I already opened it. I'm gonna rinse them. I'm gonna dump them out. I'm not gonna like rinse them thoroughly. I'm literally gonna dump them out using my hand as a strainer. I'm gonna dump them out, put some water in, rinse them, and I'm gonna dump them in the pan. So just dump the juice. Now, by the way, this, the water that's in chickpeas can be used for a multitude of things. I'm just not using them tonight. Okay, I'm gonna throw a little bit of cilantro in because I love cilantro. So before I puree it off, I'm going to throw a little bit in, dice it up a little bit. I am not going to add the cream yet. I will do a little bit of that after. Like I said, I love creamy tomato soup. It's off. It's just sitting there on <laughs> um, a bowl, ma'am. Here? One more. One more. Okay, so I'm gonna grab a nice big bowl. I'm gonna dump, I'm gonna bring it over there if I can. Uh, is there another one? Mm, if you move all of that stuff out of the way, you put your bowl right there. I will do that. Um, is there another towel, ma'am? Somewhere. That's all right, I can use a paper towel. Mm. Oh, perfect. Thank you. I'm gonna take my bowl, I'm gonna dump it, and then I'm gonna bring it where you can see it. 
but I just want you to see. I mean, how awesome does that look? You have like tons of vegetables in here. So much yumminess. So I'm gonna move some stuff out of the way. I'm gonna make room right here. I'm gonna get this out of the way a little bit. I don't know, I might keep the fresh basil because oh my goodness, it smells so good. This is kind of like when I hope that you have smell vision because it'd be so much fun for you to be able to smell what I'm smelling. But hopefully you're smelling the same thing at your house and that it's delicious. So here we go. We have, I'm gonna throw this through an immersion blender. And you gotta remember, I didn't add my tomatoes, my diced tomatoes. I didn't add my diced tomatoes. So I'm gonna add those in once we puree it and once we get the flavor to where we want it to be. And as you can see, this is just pureeing, churning it up. And again, if you have a blender, you can section it. You can do it in two or three pieces if you need to, if it's too much for your blender. I'm trying to make sure the cilantro gets sucked up in there. It's sitting on the top. So mine isn't super red right now because you gotta remember, I didn't add my tomatoes yet. And you also can add more tomatoes. You can add tomato paste. Jenny, yes. this is actually a question for Pam. What immersion blender is that? Cause it's so it's, quiet. It's a wearing immersion blender, W-A-R-I-N-G. Okay. And it is, it's actually listed as a wearing commercial. So it's kind of the small grade commercial one. Ah, okay. Yeah, it lacks the strong whir of some of the, some of the blenders. So, and again, this is a textural issue, right? For people, you can have it so that it has a little bit of chunk to it. You can have it so it has a little bit of grit to it or you can blend it until there is nothing but smooth as silk soup. So it's completely up to you. There's no right or wrong. I'm gonna pause for a second and taste it. Cause then I'm going to add, what spoons? Okay, so, smells so good. Mm. So good. It needs a little bit more flavor though. So right now I am going to add my diced tomatoes. And by the way, something I didn't show you earlier. Again, I mentioned the spice thing, right? Some people like a little heat. So I have diced tomatoes. I also have diced tomatoes with green chilies. This Rotel, is a great little add to make a fresh salsa, to put in a lot of things if you like that tiny bit of heat. So you could add this if you needed to. So I'm gonna drain these because I don't want too, too much liquid. And then I'm gonna add the diced tomatoes right to the soup. There we go. And now I'm gonna pick up more of that red, that traditional red color, right? Because adding the tomatoes. Now I made a decent sized pan of soup. So I may end up deciding to add even the Rotel. Oops, sorry over. Nerve entry, right elbow. <laughs> no control. I made a decent sized pan of soup. So I may need to add an additional thing of tomatoes. But you get that good, you can see all the herbs getting blended into it. Taste it one more time, see where we're at. Oh, we're getting there. So good. Now again, this is an earthy way to do this, right? Like you're not using, I'm trying to show it to you, but I'm right-handed with a nerve injury in my right hand. So it's in my right elbow rather, so it's a little bit tougher. 
But you can see that it has a beautiful color, a little lighter than what most people would consider that traditional tomato soup, right? Because it isn't just tomatoes. You have all of those amazing vegetables in it. So you got that. Now, I know I want a little bit more herb in mine. I'm going to add a little bit of actually fresh basil now. So obviously this basil hasn't been cooked off. It's gonna be a little stronger when I add it. I'm also gonna add a little bit more cilantro. Nerve injuries are so fun. <laughs> All right, got a little bit of that. I'm gonna top mine at the end with a little bit of fresh scallions. If you don't like onions, you wouldn't like that. I'm also gonna throw in a little bit of fresh parsley. And of course, by the way, I haven't forgotten your spinach awaits, right? So once I get these herbs in, scoop them up a couple times. Once I get these herbs in, we're gonna do some fresh diced on our spinach. We're gonna add that. I do not care if the spinach is totally pureed. Now, when would you care? If you have a child you're trying to hide it from, that's when you care and you wanna put it in before and then puree it. However, for me, I love spinach and I don't care if it's entirely pureed, but if you do, put it in right when you turn off your soup, right? When you turn off your soup, you can chop it and put it in then because then you can hide it completely. So let's get our spinach. And your toast should all be done. You should smell all of that amazing deliciousness. Now, I know that Pam likes a little heat. So I'm gonna add in some of the chilies that I brought because the least I can do is if I'm come taking over somebody's kitchen and she's nice enough to sit here and run the camera, the nicest thing I could do is feed her and at least try and hit the flavor palette she prefers. And where Cajun cooking is her go-to. We're gonna amp up the heat a little bit. So here goes the spinach. And I'm gonna open the can of green chilies. Try and open the can of green chilies. There we go. And I'm gonna add them to it. And then I want you to, after you puree it, again, taste it. You may need a little more pepper. You may need some adobo. You may want a little bit of garlic, whatever works for you. But just make sure you don't add salt unless you absolutely feel like you need to, because there's a lot of different alternatives to salt that adds a lot of flavor without the unhealthiness that actually salt can add. And don't get me wrong, a little salt isn't bad, but we get salt in so many different foods already that rarely do we need to add pure salt. But this country has kind of gotten us used to pure salt is the thing that people add. So, all right. We're getting there, we're getting there. Any questions from anybody? Or how's the flavor on your end? Where you're at so far? What do you think? Anybody have any questions or things that? Well, mine tastes like rosé because that's what I've been drinking. <laughs> I'm not sure you followed the recipe right. <laughs> it's bad i'm just saying i'm not sure it was actually the recipe <laughs> <laughs> i did Anybody just want to give else? you a i did want to give you a time check we're at 6 38 p.m okay so, yeah well here we are so 
we have cheesy toast, which I need some. And here, Tony's laughing at me because I started by saying this was probably going to be a faster class than normal. Exactly. <laughs> and clearly, here I am talking, talking, talking. But I got to tell you, just to be clear, this is one of my favorite meals. And if that does not incentivize you to want to make this, I don't know what will. So I will sign off here though. Welcome to Cooking Live Time with Jenny. This is one of my favorite meals, a healthier version on tomato soup. And instead of grilled cheese, cheesy toast. If you have any questions, reach out. I'm happy to answer them. Thank you for joining us. And I will see you next month back here, partnered with the Hyannis Public Library, where we're not only working to increase nutritional security, but nutritional literacy. Thank you for joining us tonight, you guys.